the last people that remain here. Thank you for being patient enough to wait um, and gracious enough to hopefully not run away when I start talking. Um, the future of VR is, is pretty much in the, in the focus of everything. Um, if you're an indie developer, as, as we are, and these guys were, then you constantly worry where the money is getting, going to come from. And it's, the answer is nowhere specific, so it's really hard to make money in VR. But I want to try to do a talk that's maybe a little less practical and a little more um, hopefully controversial to a degree, so maybe we get a discussion started at the end of that. Um, a little bit of background, um, Black Cell, my studio, or the, the studio that I co-founded, uh, it's the first Austrian studio, which isn't saying much because there aren't that many studios in Austria. Um, our first release, Wake Up, in 2016, was lucky enough to get a, a good rating on Steam, so we down, have enough, about 50,000 downloads, and the reason we have them is that number which is for VR on Steam relatively high, um, is we didn't charge anything for it, as many people do, so we didn't make a buck out of that. Um, however, it allowed us to establish uh, a reputation for quality, and that helped us to sign a deal with, um, uh, for Star VR with uh, IMAX Arcades and Starbreeze, who are paying our bills. Um, and we also have the Do Something Else Than Games in the ADHD treatment and um, project that, that is done with the Children's Hospital and get some state funding. So this is. We are typically in the developer, we had moderate success, we are lucky enough to get paid um, for the moment, but uh, we struggle as everybody else's. Um, my personal history, I've been in the industry for 25 years, so I've seen a couple of platforms come and go, and this is basically also where my perspective onto VR comes from, um, because I think there, there are a couple of mm, common things that I tend hearing in the industry that, that aren't really helping VR as such, and that, that are, are weird complaints from developers um, or publishers at that time. Um, there was a, um, a Kleiner Perkins and an Upload VR, they had a, uh, like 500 or 600 people in the VR industry asked, or in the AR and VR industry, um, had a questionnaire and asked them what the biggest challenge facing the VR industry is as a whole. Um, and on top came 37% saying it was inadequate content offerings. So, in other words, there simply isn't a good game on VR that one makes people want to have VR for the game. Um, funnily enough, the second one is consumer and business reluctance to embrace AR VR innovation, which is kind of blaming the customer for not wanting something that is not attractive in the first place. So it's like, like you guys don't buy our shit, and the customer goes like, yeah, because it's not interesting, it's not good, it's not a good experience. Um, so. Only then came technical limitations um, or technological limitations. So, so about 60, 50, 56 percent of the problems in VR, according to, to these renowned experts, come from the fact that VR is just not that experience that people Im imagine it to be or want it to be. There's too many limitations. There's, you know, you have to puke all the time. Um, it's bulky. It wears you down. It's not good quality if it's mobile. It's really expensive if it's, um, if it's not mobile. Um, so what is the biggest obstacle to mass adoption of VR technology? And again, it's user experience, cost, social acceptance, exclusivity of offerings, a lot of things that stand in the way of VR success, according to the industry experts. Um, and I think there is a fundamental problem in that VR cannot simply recreate the same experience we have today on, on, on mobile or, other, other, or consoles or PC. So VR games can't be the same games just with VR added. Um, it's, if, if it's just something that makes your mm, game a little bit better, um, then, yeah, am I, am I going to buy a device for something that's a little bit better? Why should I get a mobile phone and a daydream and do that? There are specific use cases, but is that a mass adoption strategy, like make the same shit just, just more immersive? In consoles, there's a very simple saying, which is software sells hardware. So in, in consoles, when, you, when you, the Switch comes, it comes out, there is a killer app on that. Uh, Zelda had an over 100% attachment rate, meaning there were more people owning Zelda for Switch than people having a Switch. This is how you, how you, how you launch a platform. You, you don't launch a platform by making incrementally better technology 
that makes it less annoying to use. Um, the, the software needs to drive the hardware. If, if the, what we say, and, and I'm, I'm in the same game and saying, I'm complaining about the technological limitations and you know, it's, there's, there's so many things. Locomotion is a problem that's still not solved. There's so many obstacles to making good games. But by this logic, Pong would never have existed. They, they have like a controller that only does that, and they, can, they do this, and they've got uh, very few pixels to work with. And still, it became pretty successful, because they, people worked with the limitations they had and tried to make a game that used to be for exact the, these limitations. They used to be the ideal game for, the, for that very narrow space that they had. So instead of complaining about the fact that the technology is not there, the user experience is not there, the pickup rate is not there. I think we should, as, a, as an industry, ask ourselves, how can we get to that killer app? What's, what's, what's that, what can we do? And our current answer is the spectacle. It's, it's relying on the fact that um, VR, by and large, gives you a wow experience when you go in first. And then if you prolong, if you want to prolong that, and it's great, I mean, we are doing something for arcades because it's great. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful toy as a, as a development studio. It's really cool to get physical stuff. We've got a wind machine that blows wind in people's face when they start creating a storm. It adds so much to the immersion. But it's spectacle. It's, it's not sustainable. It's like, it's like a, a, an amusement park ride. Yes, you can do that. You can do that five times maybe, but are you going to do this a hundred times? What's, where is the added value in getting the same spectacle all over? And how much spectacle, you know, on a, on end on end can you create and can you consume? So the spectacle is a short term answer because it's the easiest way to push the immersive experience. But it's not sustainable as an immersive, like not, not on a home device, you can't push the spectacle to home, you can't push it to mobile. It's not something, it's like the cinema, it's, but people can go there and have a good time, but by and large, if you've got a TV that, that, or, uh, or an iPad that produces series, you're going to watch much more content on that than you're going to watch in the cinema. Cinema is, is something extra, and, and I think it's really dangerous for us as an industry to rely on a spectacle in the design and rely on the spectacle of immersion simply and saying, you know, all the rest will come because immersion is so great. I don't think that's, that's going to solve it. So, so why don't we have a killer app? Um, as I said, software sells hardware, um, yet the, the, if I look at, at VR magazines or VR sites, like 50% of the news is hardware news. There's, there's more devices than I can count. Um, this is like having 200 consoles because the first two consoles didn't sell enough content. This is a weird logic. Like, if the Xbox and the PS2 uh, or PS3 are shitty and not selling content, am I really going to have 70 more consoles that solve that problem? Um, so we look to hardware improvement to solve attachment rates. Um, my very expensive HTC Vive headset is sitting in the corner, and I use them regularly because I have to, because I play these games to understand what the market does, what everybody else does, test our own game. But I don't play as much. I, I used to play every game at least once, and now I go like, ah, oh, yeah, another rail shooter. OK, yeah. There are some games that are really, really good, but most of them are, let's face it, crap. And, and this is the reason why they don't have an attachment rate, because they don't really engage the player. They're not really good games. Um, and I'm not saying we're making good games and we know how to do that. It's, it's, you know, a lot of games are crap. But in VR, the, reluctant, the reliance on on, on the spectacle and the excuse of saying, well, you know, technology is just not there, all the limitations shouldn't prevent us from making better games that are specifically geared towards VR, that are not just games that also work in VR with a little more immersion. If that's the case, then VR is just an added gimmick. Um, immersion alone is not unique. It's, it's the same but better as for other devices. We need, we need to have something that specifically takes into account VR, and we've got some talks this, uh, today that, that already made um, reference to that, like the embodiment of the player, the, the fact that you are, your presence is there, the fact that other people's presence can be much more immediately felt. All these aspects are relatively unique to VR, and we should, we should, our design should incorporate that to a high degree. Um, so, so just doing the same games as we do in, in other genres or in other platforms and adding motion sickness surely isn't the, the solution. Um, so, 
I think we need to stop being in love with being in VR. Get over the first effect of where you fell in love with it, which is like, okay, it's, it's, it's like a relationship. You, you might for, you have love at first sight is a great thing, but to sustain a relationship over five, ten years, it takes a different amount of work. It's not just looking at it, starry eyes, and going, oh, it's so nice. You know, look, we are. Um, so, so this, I think, is some of the reasons that, that keep us back from having a killer app. Obviously, it's also the enormous amount of money you throw at stuff, and, and, the, and there are technical limitations. It's hard. It's not, I'm not saying it's easy, but I think we need, as an industry, to, to get away from that initial throw of disappointment where we are now and going like, oh, yeah, it's so hard doing VR games. Oof. Cockroach mode is important, but I don't think anybody in cockroach mode will be able to blow the market wide open with a killer app. It's just a different mindset sustaining yourselves. It's hard. So I think what we need as an industry, and I'm trying to be really short with my talk so you can now throw stuff at me and tell me that I'm an idiot. Um, I think we need to find you need, need to make uh, find you need game designs that make use of the bodily presence in every way, like the fact that you actually move yourself, the fact that you are in that space, the fact that others can be in that space, the fact that you have tracking devices that that can check a lot of, of things that are different from controls, the fact that there is a whole world around you, the fact that audio is uh, spatial audio is playing a huge sense um, role. So all that all that amount of presence is very different from, from what we have. Um, I think it's also important to create worlds that are different in order to provide unique experiences, because one thing the immersion does is give you a more immediate experience. And what I tend to see is that most people go back to realistic worlds, like as realistic as possible, to, to make a simulation of the real world. If I want real world, I, I'll just take off the headset. There, there's all the real world I can take around me. Um, maybe it's not as fun as, as in these enclosed rooms, but I don't think realism or more realism is necessarily the, the, the solution at that stage. And I think this also goes towards um, especially mobile VR, which is hampered, as we've heard, by, by technical limitations in terms of the frame rate, in terms of the, the texture and the, and the resolution. Well, if that's the case, then, then trying to be more realistic isn't, isn't going to solve it. We need to find a language, a visual language, that makes it unique and exciting and different without having to rely on, on highly detailed textures, for example. So there are ways to do that, but you need to go with a weakness and take it and work with it and see what comes out of that as opposed to trying to do something and then always sort of running against that wall that that technology gives you. Um, don't rely on the spectacle to gloss over lack of designs. Um, it's, it's an easy trap to fall into. And I think it's, it's important to add new perspectives to the experience. And we have that. We have, like initially, when we are started out, there were things that let you fly. There were things that let you rail shoot. There were things that let you sit in roller coaster and vomit. And then, after a while, the, the, a lot of the sort of genres crystallized already into there's escape room games, because they work really well in VR. There's horror, which works well. There's rail shooters. And then there, there's, there's a couple of other sport titles that, that work. But there isn't a VR-specific genre. Like the jump and run is a specific genre that, that really translates. It does exist on, on PC, but it was sort of brought in by the console, and by, by especially by the handhelds. And there is no comparable genre that VR actually created yet. There's no genre there where we go like, this is, this is what VR can do that no other can do as well, because it's not, no of the other, none of the other devices is as conveniently usable for that, or is as immersive, or is at, as good at doing that. And don't blame the customer. This is the, like, attachment rates are low, of course. Yeah, there's not enough devices out there. Yeah, that's right. You can't, you're not get, gonna get rich in VR. But, but making, like making the customer responsible for not buying our, our games is like a weird reaction. And, and I've seen that in developers a lot and, and in some of the publishers where they go like, yeah, the attachment rates are not there. So the logic is we're not going to do something interesting because not enough people there, so there's not, never going to be enough people coming. Where should that hardware revolution, that, that mainstream explosion, where should that come from? Why should people buy a device they don't need if it only costs 600 euro instead of 900 euro? Why should I spend 200 euro for a device I don't need? If, if I don't have a compelling reason to buy, and the compelling reason is going to be the software, I'm, I'm not going to buy it at any price point. Um, so, so I think it's important for us as an industry to 
to own up to that, to that responsibility and try to find that killer app, which is an easy thing to say. Um, but it's, it's a much different forward-looking um, impulse and, and work within the limitations as, a, as opposed to complaining about the limitations and saying, well, we'll wait until the success happens because I don't think it'll happen by itself. And, and this is the end of my talk. And you can now discuss or throw things at me. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, nobody threw anything at you, so I think you're okay on that one. Um, has anybody got any questions? I can't be more provocative than that. You must, you must have a reaction <laughs> going like, this guy is, a, is an arsehole, at least. No, I think you got away with it. I think you're okay. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay.